Section 3 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joe Chekai. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. The Magic of the Horseshoe, Part 3. Blacksmiths credited with supernatural attributes. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, the Hephaestus of Grecian mythology, was also the patron of blacksmiths and workers in metals. He was the great artisan of the universe, and at his workshop in Olympus he fashioned armor for the warriors of the heroic age. On earth, volcanoes were his forges, and his favorite residence was the island of Lemnos in the Aegean Sea. Beneath Edna, with the aid of those famed artisans, the Cyclops, he forged the thunderbolts of Jove, and there also, according to tradition, were made the trident of Neptune, Pluto's helmet, and the shield of Hercules. Hephaestus was thus a controller and master of fire. The Cyclops were believed by the ancients to have invented the art of forging, and the discovery of the peculiar qualities of iron was attributed to certain mythical beings called the Dactyls, who dwelt in Phrygia, and who were thought to have acquired this knowledge from observation of the fusion of metals at the fabulous burning of Mount Ida. The Dactyls had the reputation of being wizards, whose very names possessed a mysterious protective power when pronounced by persons exposed to sudden dangers. Certain semi-fabulous tribes of Central Asia, workers in metals, kept secret the mysteries of their craft, and were wont to indulge in wild orgies and festivities, which served to inspire with awe the uninitiated. At such times they danced until frenzied with excitement, to the accompaniment of cymbals and tambourines and the clashing of weapons. The people of neighboring tribes feared to approach them, believing that they were possessed of a magical power, which enabled them to transform one metal into another and to forge thunderbolts. They were reputed to be masters of fire and of the elements, and their forges, like Vulcans, were volcanoes. These barbarous peoples were sometimes confounded with the Dactyls, Corybantis, Kabiri, and Kuretis, traditional metallurgists endowed with supernatural skill, and therefore popularly reckoned as magicians, or even as divinities. For a long period, they were supposed to be vested with the exclusive knowledge of metalworking, a knowledge shrouded in mystery. In the Kalevala, or ancient epic poem of Finland, the blacksmith Ilmarinen is represented as the pioneer and most skilled of artisans, who fashioned both the implements of warfare and domestic utensils. This hero came to earth to work the metal. He was born upon the coal mount, skilled and nurtured in the coal fields, in one hand a copper hammer, in the other tongs of iron. In the night was born the blacksmith, in the morn he built his smithy, sought with care a favored hillock where the winds might fill his bellows, found a hillock in the swampland where the iron hid abundant. There he built his smelting furnace. In the Teutonic mythology, blacksmiths were magical craftsmen, and even in the Middle Ages they were looked upon as superior to other artisans, owing to their faculty of seemingly toying with fire, rendering the dangerous element subservient to their will, and by its aid manipulating iron with ease and dexterity. In Germany, their workshops were known as Weiland's houses, in remembrance of the most cunning of smiths in the mythical lore of the North. As in early ages the origin of metalworking was imputed to divine beings, it was natural that, in popular tradition, blacksmiths acquired their wondrous technical skill through the assistance of such beings, and hence were exalted above the plane of ordinary mortals because they had received supernatural instruction. The following medieval legend serves to show that memories of the old pagan traditions lingered in the minds of the Scandinavians until long after the establishment among them of Christianity. One evening in the year 1208, a horseman rode up to the house of a blacksmith named Thord Vetter, who lived in southern Norway at Nesjar, near the town of Lorvig, on the Skager Rack, and asked for lodging overnight and shoeing for his horse. The smith assented, and early the next morning began the work, chatting, meanwhile, with his guest. Where were you last night? he inquired of the latter. In Medalda, was the reply. And where were you the night before? asked the smith. In Jardal, answered the stranger. You must be a tremendous liar, said the smith, with great frankness. Then he applied himself to his task in earnest, and forged the biggest horseshoes which he had ever seen but which were found to fit the horse's feet perfectly. In the course of further conversation, the traveler remarked that he had long dwelt in the north of Norway and was on his way to Sweden. When he was ready to continue journeying and had mounted his steed, the smith inquired his name. Have you ever heard of Odin? was the rejoinder. I have heard his name, said the smith. Then you may see him now, remarked the horseman. And if you do not believe what I have told you, look how I leap my horse over the fence. Thereupon he spurred the animal and rode straight at the courtyard fence, which was seven ells high. The gallant steed cleared the fence with ease, and neither he nor his rider were seen again by the worthy blacksmith. The dignity and importance of the blacksmith's art in early medieval times in England is illustrated by the following tale from Paul Sebillot's Legendes et Curiosities de Messieurs Art. Forgerons. King Alfred the Great, who reigned in the latter part of the ninth century, 
On one occasion, assembled together seven of his principal mechanics and craftsmen, and announced that he would appoint as their chief that one who could longest dispense with the assistance of the others, and he also invited them all to a banquet, on condition that each should bring with him a specimen of his handiwork and the tools wherewith it was made. At the appointed time, they all appeared. The blacksmith brought his hammer and a horseshoe, the tailor his scissors and a newly made garment, the baker his long-handled wooden bread shovel and a loaf of bread, the shoemaker his awl and a pair of new shoes, the carpenter his saw and a squared plank, the butcher his chopping knife and a large piece of meat, and the mason his trowel and a cornerstone. After careful deliberation, the company decided that the tailor's work was the best, and he was accordingly chosen to be chief of the artisans. The blacksmith was vexed at the choice and vowed he would work no more, so long as the tailor was chief. He therefore closed his shop and took his departure. But his absence was speedily felt. The king's horse lost a shoe. The six comrades, one after another, broke their tools, and although the tailor continued to ply his trade longer than the others, he too was soon obliged to cease from work. Thereupon the king and his tradesmen decided to try their hands at blacksmithing, but met with ill success. For the king's horse trod on his royal master, the tailor burnt his fingers, and the others met with various mishaps. At length they began to quarrel among themselves, even coming to blows, and in the melee the anvil was overturned with a crash. Just at this point, St. Clement appeared on the scene arm in arm with the blacksmith. The king saluted the newcomers respectfully and addressed them as follows. I have made a bad mistake my friends, in allowing myself to be beguiled by the tailor's fine cloth and his skillful handiwork. In common fairness, the blacksmith, without whose aid the other workmen can accomplish nothing, should be proclaimed chief artisan. All the tradesmen except the tailor then begged the worthy smith to make new tools for them, which he forthwith proceeded to do, even including a brand new pair of scissors for the tailor. Then the king reorganized the society of artisans and proclaimed as chief the blacksmith, whom all greeted with wishes for good health and happiness. After this, the king called on each one for a song, and the new chief, in his turn, sang one entitled The Merry Blacksmith, which is even nowadays sometimes heard at the festivities of tradesmen's guilds in England. St. Clement, who figures in the above tale, was the patron saint of farriers. He was a Roman bishop who died in A.D. 100. In ecclesiastical tradition, he was reckoned among the martyrs, having been bound to an anchor and thrown into the sea on November 23rd of that year. His name day was still observed in recent times by English blacksmiths, who regarded him as the originator of the art of practical farriery, and held an annual festival in his honor. The blacksmiths' apprentices of the Woolwich Dockyard were wont to form a procession on the evening of St. Clement's Day, one of their number personating Old Clem with masked face, oakum wig, and long white beard. During the festivities, this worthy delivered a speech in part as follows. I am the real St. Clement, the first founder of brass, iron, and steel from the ore. I have been to Mount Aetna, where the god Vulcan first built his forge and forged the armor and thunderbolts for the god Jupiter. St. Eloy, or St. Eligius, is sometimes represented as the guardian of farriers and blacksmiths. He flourished in the 7th century and in his youth served as apprentice to a goldsmith at Limoges, where he became very proficient in the art of working the precious metals. His festival occurs on December 1st. According to a well-known legend, St. Eloy was once shoeing a demoniac horse, which refused to stand still. He therefore cut off the animal's leg and put on the shoe. Then, making the sign of the cross, he replaced the leg, the horse experiencing no ill effects from the operation. This saint is mentioned in Barnaby Gook's Popish Kingdom as follows, And Loy the smith doth look to horse, and smiths of all degree, if they with iron metal here, or if they goldsmiths be. In certain countries, blacksmiths and farriers have always been credited with supernatural faculties, and it seems, therefore, reasonable thus to explain the origin of some portion of the alleged mystic virtues of their handiwork, the iron horseshoe, although indeed this view does not appear to have been advanced hitherto. Among ourselves and in some of the principal European countries, blacksmiths are highly respectable members of society, although they do not usually deal in occult science. But in portions of the Russian Empire, as in the province of Mingrelia, the Caucasus, and neighboring regions, blacksmiths do enjoy a certain reputation as magicians. Solemn oaths are taken upon the anvil instead of upon the Bible. In Abyssinia and in the Congo country, all iron workers have the reputation of sorcerers, and among the Tibos of Central Africa, they are treated with great deference. When an inhabitant of the Orkney Islands wishes to obtain an amulet, he applies either to a farrier or to his son or grandson, and the Romanian gypsies are mostly blacksmiths, their wives obtaining a livelihood by mendicancy, the practice of divination, and the interpretation of dreams, while both men and women are thought to have the faculty of summoning to their aid powerful spirits of the air.
In Morocco at the present day, there still exists a community of dwarfish artisans, workers in metals, magicians, and adepts in the healing art, who make little books which are used as portable amulets. And the Haratin, who inhabit the Draw Valley, seem as sinful even to mention by name these dwarves, whom they consider entitled to extraordinary respect. Each member of this mysterious tribe of pygmy smiths is said to wear a hike or outer garment, having upon the back a representation of an eye, a symbol suggestive of the Cyclops of old. There was, indeed, as we have seen, a common opinion throughout a great part of Europe that the earliest smiths were supernatural beings, for it was reasoned that the marvelous process of melting and fashioning iron could not have been conceived by man, but must have originated through magical agencies. In Germany, blacksmiths' forges were often situated on highways remote from settlements and were the resort of travelers and teamsters who stopped either to have a horse shod or to obtain veterinary advice. Quite naturally, these smithies, like the modern Crossroads variety stores, became little centers of sociability and gossip and even of conviviality. Moreover, questionable characters sometimes frequented these places, and hence their reputation was not always savory. But the blacksmith himself, by virtue of his calling, was looked upon with respect, even after his craft had ceased to inspire the vulgar with mysterious awe. In South Germany and the Tyrol, when a blacksmith rests from his work on a Saturday evening, he strikes with his hammer three blows upon the anvil, thereby chaining up the devil for the ensuing week. And so likewise, while hammering a horseshoe into shape, he strikes the anvil instead of the shoe every fourth or fifth blow, and thus makes doubly secure the chain wherewith Satan is bound. Blacksmiths are usually clever enough to recognize the devil, even when disguised as a gentleman. Once upon a time, the evil one appeared at the door of a smith in the village of Gossensass, on the Brenner Road, Tyrol, and wished to have his two horses shod. When the work was done, he inquired how much he should pay, but the shrewd smith refused to take any money and only stipulated that his customer should never enter the shop again, which the devil promised and went away. The magicians of Hindustan, when treating cases of alleged demoniacal possession, after the performance of other mystic rites, are wont to sprinkle the patient with water from a blacksmith's shop, the water having been endowed with additional virtue by the repeated immersion of iron. In northeast Scotland, a cure for rickets consists in having the child bathed by a blacksmith in the water trough of the smithy. Then he is laid on the anvil and iron implements are passed over him, the use of each being asked, and the ceremony is followed by a second bath. To ensure the efficacy of this process, three blacksmiths of the same name must take part in it. In Henderson's Folklore of the Northern Countries of England, page 187, mention is made of a remarkable method of treatment intended for the development of sickly, puny children who are thought to be under the influence of an evil spell which retards their growth, a notable instance of survival of the old belief in the blacksmith's magical powers. Very early in the morning, the little patient is brought to the shop of a smith of the seventh generation, if such can be found, and laid quite naked on the anvil. The blacksmith raises his hammer thrice as if to strike a glowing horseshoe, each time letting it gently fall on the child's body. A simple ceremony, but vastly promotive of the child's physical welfare in the mind of its rustic parents. The farriers of the Arabs inhabiting the oases of the Great Sahara Desert are exempt from taxes and enjoy numerous privileges. Of these, the most important and striking, as showing the honor accorded to the men of this craft, is the following. When on the battlefield a mounted farrier is hard-pressed by enemies, he runs the risk of being killed so long as he remains upon his horse with weapons in his hand. But if he alights, kneels down, and with the corners of his hooded cloak or burnus, imitates the movements of a pair of bellows, thus revealing his profession, his life is spared. The Baralongs of South Africa regard the art of smelting and forging as sacred, and when the metal begins to flow, none are permitted to approach the furnaces except those who are initiated in the mysteries of the craft. In Finland, also, blacksmiths are held in profound respect, and the greatest luxuries are none too good for them. They are presented with brandy to keep them in good humor, and a Finnish proverb says, Fine bread always for the smith, and dainty morsels for the hammerer. Among certain tribes of the west coast of equatorial Africa, the blacksmith officiates also as priest or medicine man, and is a chief personage in the community, which often embraces several adjacent villages. Indeed, there appears to be a quite general belief in different portions of Africa that metal workers as a class are superior beings, of higher origin than their fellow tribesmen. When a savage people, without a knowledge of farriery, acquired by conquest a new territory and found therein blacksmiths plying their vocation, they naturally regarded these artisans with wonder, not unmixed with fear. Moreover, the early association in mythology and tradition of metalworking and sorcery appears to explain in a measure, as already suggested, the reason for the magical properties popularly ascribed to horseshoes and to iron articles generally. 8. Fire as a spirit-scaring element 
The horseshoe is a product of the artisan's skill by the aid of fire. This element has in all ages been considered the great purifier and a powerful foe to evil spirits. The Chaldeans venerated fire and esteemed it a deity, and among primitive nations everywhere it has ever been held sacred. The Persians had fire temples, called Perea, devoted solely to the preservation of the holy fire. In the Rig Veda, the principal sacred book of the Hindus, the crackling of burning faggots was listened to as the voice of the gods, and the same superstition prevails still among the natives of Borneo. In a fragment of the writings of Menander Protector, a Greek historian of the 6th century, it is related that when an embassy sent by the emperor Justin reached Sogdiana, the ancient Bokhara, it was met by a party of Turks who proceeded to exercise their baggage by beating drums and ringing bells all over it. They then ran around the baggage, bearing aloft flaming leaves, meantime, by their gestures and movements, seeking to repel evil spirits, after which some of the party themselves passed through the fire as a means of purification. Fire is especially potent against nocturnal demons, and also against the evil spirits which cause disease in cattle. Hence the utility of the ancient need fires produced by the friction of two pieces of wood, which were thought to be an antidote against the moraine and epizootics generally, a custom until recently in vogue in the Scottish Highlands, and formerly practiced in many other regions. The midsummer fires kindled on St. John's Eve, in accordance with an ancient British custom, were regarded as purifiers of the air. Moreover, the whole area of ground illuminated by these fires was reckoned to be freed from sorcery for a year, and, by leaping through the flames, both men and cattle were ensured safety against demons for a like period. In Ireland, it was customary for people to run through the streets on St. John's Eve, carrying long poles, upon which were tied flaming bundles of straw, in order to purify the air. For at that time, all kinds of mischievous imps, hobgoblins, and devils were abroad, intent on working injury to human beings. Midsummer fires were still lighted in Ireland in the latter half of the 19th century, a survival of pagan fire worship. In many countries, people gathered about the bonfires, while children leaped through the flames and live coals were carried into the cornfields as an antidote to blight. Sometimes the remaining ashes were scattered over the neighboring fields in order to protect the crops from ravaging vermin or insects, and in Sweden, the smoke of need fires was reputed to stimulate the growth of fruit trees and to impart luck to fishing nets hung up in it. When a child is born, the Hindus light fires to frighten demons, and for the same reason lamps are swung to and fro at weddings, and fire is carried before the dead body at a funeral. Devout Brahmins keep a fire constantly burning in their houses and worship it daily, expecting thereby to secure for themselves good fortune. The origin of the respect accorded to fire among these people has been attributed to its potency in alleviating or curing certain diseases, as, for example, when applied in the actual cautery, or by means of the moxa, for, wherever a belief exists in a demoniacal possession as the cause of bodily disorders, the cure of the latter is evidence that the malignant spirits have been put to flight. The fire-worshipping Parsis also keep a fire continuously in the lying-in room, and when a child is ailing from any cause, they fasten to its left arm a magical charm of written words prepared by a priest, exercising the evil spirits in the name of their chief deity, Ormuzd, and binding them by power and beauty of fire. On the birth of a child among the Khoi Khoi of South Africa, a household fire is kindled, which is maintained until the healing of the child's navel. And when a member of the tribe goes a-hunting, his wife is careful to keep a fire burning indoors, for if it were allowed to go out, the husband would have no luck. The conception of a medieval smith as a master and controller of fire was embodied in a group of figures modeled by the Austrian sculptor Karl Bitter and placed at the southern entrance of the administration building at the World's Fair, Chicago, in 1893. This group, which was called Fire Controlled, consisted of a female figure whose uplifted right hand carried a torch, while at her feet stood a brawny smith resting a sledgehammer upon the prostrate form of a fire demon. Above this group stood a single figure by the same artist, representing a blacksmith standing at his anvil, with hammer resting against it, and in his belt hung a pair of pincers. In his left hand was a horseshoe, which he was examining. 9. The Serpentine Shape of the Horseshoe the theory has been advanced that in ancient idolatrous times, the horseshoe in its primitive form was a symbol in serpent worship, and that its superstitious use as a charm may have thus originated. This seems plausible enough inasmuch as there is a resemblance between the horseshoe and the arched body of the snake, when the latter is so convoluted that its head and tail correspond to the horseshoe prongs. Both snakes and horseshoes were anciently engraved on stones and metals, presumably as amuletic symbols, and in front of a church in Crendi, a town in the southern part of the island of Malta, there is to be seen a statue having at its feet a protective symbol in the shape of a half-moon encircled by a snake. The serpent played an important role in Asiatic and ancient Egyptian symbolism. 
This has been thought to be due partly to a belief that the sun's path through the heavens formed a serpentine curve, and partly because lightning, or the fertilizing fire, sometimes flashes upon the earth in a snake-like zigzag. The serpent was endowed with the attributes of divinity on account of its graceful and easy movements, the brightness of its eyes, the function of discarding its skin, a process which was regarded as emblematic of a renewal of its youth, and its instantaneous spring upon its prey. The worship of serpents is of great antiquity, the earliest authentic accounts of the custom being found in Chaldean and Chinese astronomical works. It was nearly universal among the most ancient nations of the world, and this universality has been ascribed to the traditionary remembrance of the serpent in Eden, and has given rise to the opinion of some writers that snake worship may have been the primitive religion of the human race. On the walls of houses in Pompeii are to be seen the figures of snakes, which are believed to have been intended as preservative symbols, and we learn from Mr. C. G. Lelland's Etruscan Roman remains that the peasants of the mountainous regions in northern Italy, known as the Romagna Toscana, have a custom of painting on the walls of their houses the figures of serpents which the heads and tails pointing upward. These are intended both as amulets to keep away witches and as luck bringers, and are therefore exact counterparts of the horseshoe and the crescent as magical emblems. The more interlace the snake's coils, the more effective the amulet. The idea being that a witch is obliged to trace out and follow with her eye the interweaving convolutions, and that in attempting to do this, she becomes bewildered and is temporarily rendered incapable of doing harm. In ancient Roman works of art, the serpent is sometimes portrayed as a protective symbol. In some bronze figures of fortune unearthed at Herculaneum, serpents are represented either as encircling the arm of the goddess or as entwined about her cornucopia, thus typifying, as it were, the idea of the intimate association of the snake with good luck. The Phoenicians rendered homage to serpents, and history shows that the Lithuanians, some Martians, or inhabitants of ancient Poland, and other nations of Central Europe, treated these reptiles with superstitious respect. In Russia, also, domestic snakes were formerly carefully nurtured, for they were thought to bring good fortune to the members of a household. The worship of serpents is still practiced in Persia, Tibet, Ceylon, and other eastern islands. In Western Africa, also, the serpent is a chief deity and is appealed to by the natives in seasons of drought and pestilence. A talisman having the form of a snake, and known as La Serena, is in use among the lower classes at Naples. In the folklore of the South Slavonian nations, the serpent is regarded as a protective genius, not only of the people, but of domestic animals and houses as well. Every human being has a snake as tutelary divinity, with which his growth and well-being are closely connected, and the killing of one of these sacred creatures was formerly deemed a grave offense. To meet with a snake has long been accounted fortunate in some countries. The South Slav peasant believes that whoever encounters one of these creatures on first going into the woods in the spring will be prosperous throughout the year. But on the other hand, he regards it as an evil omen if he happens to catch a glimpse of his own tutelary serpent. Fortunately, however, a man never knows which particular ophidian is his special guardian. The relation of the serpent to sculptured or engraved stones reveals to us the reptile is still the object of veneration, if not of adoration, among widely remote nations. If we search among the tombs of Egypt, Assyria, and Etruria, we shall find innumerable cygnets, cylinders, and scarabae of gems engraved with serpents. These were proverbially worn as amulets or used as insignia of authority, and in the temples and tombs of these and other countries, serpents are engraved or sculptured or painted either as hieroglyphics or as forming symbolical ornaments of deities or genii. In India, they are sculptured twining around all the gods of the cave temples which mark the graves of kings and heroes, and the oldest of the Scandinavian runes are written within the folds of serpents engraved on stones. In ancient Mexican temples, the serpent symbol is frequently seen. The approach to the temple of El Castillo at Chichen in Yucatan is guarded by a pair of huge serpent heads and a second pair protect the entrance to the sanctuary. Figures of serpents also appear in the mosaic relief designs of the facades and within on the sanctuary walls. So, too, in the temples of Palenque and other southern Mexican towns, serpents are everywhere plentiful in the decorations and sculptures. Representations of snakes are to be seen on the walls of houses in many parts of India at the present day, and villages have their special Ophite guardians. The fifth day of the first or bright half of the lunar month, Shravana, which nearly corresponds with August, is celebrated by the Brahmins in honor of the Naga, or Cobra. Some interesting details of the ceremonies on these occasions are given in Balfour's Cyclopedia of India. We learn from this source that native women are wont at such times to join in dancing around snake holes, and also to prostrate themselves and invoke blessing, while others bow down before living cobras at their own homes, or worship figures of serpents. 
Visits from snakes are highly appreciated as auspicious events, and the reptiles are sure of a hospitable reception, because they are looked upon as tutelary divinities. Thus, the serpent was held sacred by the nations of antiquity, being a prominent feature in every mythology and symbolizing many pagan divinities. The Vak women of European Turkey, who inhabit villages in the mountain ranges of Thessaly and Albania, treat serpents with great respect and even with veneration. If one of the harmless white snakes which abound in the country chances to enter a cottage, it is provided with food and allowed to depart unharmed, its appearance indoors being accounted a lucky event. Such friendly treatment often results in the snakes becoming domesticated and receiving the title of house serpent. The Corinthians, too, are wont to treat snakes as fondlings, for they consider that these reptiles bring good luck proportionate in degree to their bodily diameter. Hence, they are fed with care and provided with bowls of milk twice a day. Indeed, in many countries, the serpent or dragon, originally a guardian of treasure, is considered a house protector. The same conception is embodied in the grotesque dragon-headed gargoyles so common in medieval architecture. Dr. Daniel G. Britton, in speaking of the emblematic significance of the serpent among American aborigines, remarks that this symbol has ever been associated with religious mysteries. Many derivatives from the Hebrew and Arabic words for serpent signify the practice of sorcery, consultation with familiar spirits, and intercourse with demons. It would seem, therefore, not improbable that the horseshoe amulet has acquired some portion of the magical influences ascribed to it through its serpentine form. The serpent symbol has furnished a theme for many writers, and sumptuous volumes attest its deep interest. The chief points which relate to our present subject are briefly, 1. The similarity of form between the horseshoe and a serpentine coil, and 2. The association of ideas resulting therefrom in the popular mind. The horseshoe, when allied symbolically to the serpent, represents a creature which has ever been an object of superstition, whether as a deity, household guardian, or embodiment of evil. Hence it suggests a magical power, whether good or evil, but chiefly the idea of beneficent protective influence. 10. The Horseshoe Arch in Ancient Caledonian Hieroglyphics the horseshoe arch was a common emblem on pagan monuments and is frequently seen in Caledonian sculptured hieroglyphics, where it is believed to have had a special significance as a protective symbol. Lieutenant Colonel Forbes Leslie, in The Early Races of Scotland, remarks that the horseshoe arch was probably emblematic of the serpent as a protecting and beneficent power, because this arch closely resembles a peculiar mark or attribute of the so-called Najendra, the hooded serpent king, a chief deity in the mythical lore of Salem. It would appear quite unnecessary to refer to the Singhalese mythology in this connection, inasmuch as the close resemblance between the shape of the horseshoe and the arched body of a snake has already been commented on. As illustrative of the somewhat unique theory which claims the ancient horseshoe arch, itself a talismanic symbol, as the original source of all the superstitions associated with the modern iron horseshoe, it may be appropriate to quote a few lines from the authority above mentioned. Whatever this figure, the horseshoe arch, may have represented to our heathen ancestors, it seems very likely that from it the horseshoe derived its supposed power of promoting the fortune of its possessor and protecting him against threatened calamities, whether designed by men or demons. Superstition clung to this symbol that was hallowed by antiquity, and even impressed this emblem of paganism on the Christianity by which it was superseded. The historian Diodorus Siculus said that the Chaldeans imagined the earth as having the shape of a round boat turned upside down. The boats still used on the rivers Tigris and Euphrates resemble and form a beehive with a considerable bulge in the middle. Gerald Massey, The Natural Genesis, Volume II, page 63, says that this conception of the Earth's figure corresponds to the Egyptian foot sign with its hollow underneath. Various forms of this formation of the world are extant. The horseshoe is one, hence its value as a symbol of superstition. The headdress of the Egyptian goddess Hathor has the shape of a horseshoe, the letter omega is another form of the same sign. The Reverend C. Vernon Harcourt, in his Doctrine of the Deluge, Volume I, page 141, suggests that the moon was anciently regarded as particularly sacred when in the first quarter, because at that period it resembled most closely the Ark of Noah, which was crescent-shaped. Again, the horseshoe form is believed to be a survival of an ancient religious symbol often seen in Assyrian and Egyptian sculptures, signifying the mystical door of life. The D of the Italic alphabets placed on its back reveals its early picture origin, while the Greek delta represents a tent door. The Egyptian hieroglyph for ten was a downward open loop. It is plain, therefore, that the horseshoe is the mystical door reduced to its simplest possible form, and is a fetish for bringing good luck, 
or as a talisman to avert the evil eye. It would have no meaning except with the points downward. From a scientific standpoint, therefore, the horseshoe, when used as a protective symbol, should be placed with its convex arch uppermost. But as a luck token, the reverse position is the proper one, else, according to a popular notion, the luck may be spilled out. In northern Germany and Bavaria, figures of horseshoes are sometimes cut on boundary stones, as, for example, on a stone which separates the hamlets Ellerbeck and Wellingdorf, suburbs of Kiel, and, again, on one between the estates of Deppenau and Bockhorn in Middle Holstein. In these cases, the idea involved is probably that of the beneficent horseshoe arch, impartially guarding the interests of both villages or estates. End of section 3. Read by Joe Chekai.